Hi, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm Eric Sarain with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm representing uh, work that some of the recent work that Chris Loring's done over in Ten Mile, as well as a lot of the, the previous work that's been done there. Um, I think this is could be considered one of the, the legacy IMWs we've been monitoring there for 27 years now, and so the uh, initial study, the paired, Ten Mile Cummins Ten Paired Watershed Study, uh, took place. It started in the 90s through the early 2000s, uh, looking at the effects of of wood additions uh, in the in these in the streams, and this was you know Steve Johnson, Jeff Rogers, Mario Salazzi, uh, Tom Nicholson, uh, same group of people that were involved in the LC Lobster Creek uh, paired watershed study earlier, and um, so I'm going to be kind of summarizing some of the things we learned with that initial paired watershed study, but also kind of looking at what we've gained from the additional monitoring that's gone on for years after where that initial study finished up. So the initial study was for that 10 years, that kind of magic time period, I guess, um, with some you know, pre and post monitoring. Um, but the monitoring has continued after that initial study wrapped up uh, under the aegis of our semi life cycle monitoring project, where we continue looking at work at a reduced level at 10 Mile and Cummins Creek. And we're currently at year 27 then in, in of monitoring at 10 Mile. And so reduced in stream structure and complex com complexity is, you know, it's it's an important factor potentially limiting uh, a salmon production. It was identified, you know, in our um, ODFW's uh, Coastal Multi-Species Management Plan for for Oregon Coast Steelhead as a primary limiting factor. And so this study was looking at the effects of what happens when we put uh, wood in these streams, uh, looking at the physical habitat changes that occur, but also what happens with the fish as well. And the interesting thing about these streams, and we'll take a look at the map next, is Cummins and Ten Mile are direct ocean uh, streams that, without an estuary that flow directly into the ocean. So, the the monitoring that encompasses monitoring that encompasses there encompasses all the smoke production that occurs in the in the monitoring basin. Unlike with some some smaller streams that are further up in the in the watershed, that where you may have steelhead rearing downstream of the monitoring area, that kind of makes things more complex to tell what the effects of the restoration were. So we're looking at uh, two two streams, uh, two small streams on the Oregon coast, uh, middle of the Oregon coast, just south of Newport. Uh, with Cummins Creek as our reference stream and 10 Mile where the treatment was done uh, just south of it. And again, you know, these are you know, direct ocean tribs. Uh, this is where it's flowing in just under 101 and our screw trap is just upstream of 101. So we're capturing everything that's coming out of the basin just before it hits the ocean. And so it started with a, it was intended to be a, a backy design where we have a reference and treatment stream with uh, treatments halfway through the monitoring period and, and a right variety of intensive uh, monitoring. There was a, a wood input, both planned and unplanned as a result of the 96 flood, uh, with the, the planned uh, wood inputs going into the upper watershed, and then a lot of, um, kind of natural addition in the lower watershed uh, as a result of the flood. Uh, fortunately, the, the 96 flood didn't do a lot to the reference stream. The impacts of, of the flood to the reference stream were higher above, pretty much above anadromy. And they did some really intensive monitoring. So associated with that, those, uh, with that restoration was intensive monitoring with annual summer um, habitat surveys, before and after winter habitat surveys, um, looking at uh, unit types, substrate, wood, and also looking at the, the salmon, salmon is in there, zero plus population with uh, snorkel counts, electrofishing, and then looking at all the production that was coming out of there uh, with screw trapping. Looking at coho, steelhead cutthroat, actually taking scale, scale samples, look at age structure for all those species. Um, we weren't able to resolve much with cutthroat, the scales were really difficult to read, but we were able to look at um, life history uh, diversity for coho and steelhead. And also the, that looking at age structure then allows us to relate the production from different time periods to the summer age zero population and come up with survival estimates. And so, just kind of summarize the results of that initial study. They found, you know, increases as a result, you know, in the physical template as a result of of that uh, restoration, increases both in the wood that was out there, and then then increases in the pool pool habitat, um, localized uh, changes to substrate that occurred as a result of the treatment, and then we looked at the fish numbers, and this is where things got a little bit more complicated, as we saw an increase in uh, steel and smolt abundance, freshwater production, for both our treatment and our reference stream. And we looked at zero plus abundance, 
uh, kind of looking at that, and we see actually uh, an increase in our reference stream, but not in our treatment stream. And kind of thinking about you know what the the um, impact, what that could reference is that does that mean the reference stream is uh, telling us about what's going on region wide, and that region wide there were increases, but since we don't see increases in our treatment stream, does the treatment have actually a negative impact on zero plus population? Um, we're digging into that a little bit more, looking at changes in density. We see that our reference stream was at a very low density at the initial still stages. Uh, this was the early 90s, where spawner populations were very low across the entire Oregon coast. And really, we were at a place where we were much lower, lower seeding. And we didn't get to a higher seeding level in our reference stream until after the treatment occurred. But because we have um, both the zero plus population and our soil production and age structure, we can then put that small abundance of full production in the context of what our zero plus populations were and look at freshwater survival. And in that case, we look who I saw an increase in our treatment stream and no change in our reference stream. So we do see an effect of that uh, uh, treatment in, on survival. So the results of that, you know, really quickly summarizing that initial study was that we saw, you know, changes both of phys physical and biological responses. Um, they were, we weren't able to do that initial kind of backy design because our treatment stream didn't, or didn't, the reference stream didn't track with the treatment stream. It wasn't a good reference for that. But we were able to, to kind of relate the changes pre post, both in our, our reference stream and treatment stream. We saw, you know, in the treatment stream, we saw changes in habitat. We saw changes in survival. In a reference stream, we didn't see changes in habitat. We didn't see changes in survival. We believe that's evidence for um, you know, increased survival as a result of that treatment. So I mentioned that the initial design was for 10 years, but we've continued to monitor, kind of wrapping that in, uh, you know, with Mario and, and Steve and, and Jeff Rogers, those people, the same group of people, I ended up putting together a, a coast-wide monitoring project, and there's some on a life cycle monitoring project, where we continued monitoring at Cummins Creek through 2012, gaining another additional 10 years of data on smoke production and um, age structure and life history, and we're continuing doing smoke uh, monitoring at 10 Mile Creek, you know, it's, it's, it's ongoing. We currently have 27 years of data there. So maintaining that life, um, that long time series uh, of data post post treatment. And so the continuing monitoring has been a lot less intensive. Um, during that initial 10 year period, they were doing habitat surveys anywhere. They were doing out there snorkel surveys, lecture fishing, uh, smoke monitoring. Whereas we've kind of cut back, um, done just smoke monitoring after that initial 10 year period, uh, then They've cut back further, uh, reducing just to 10 Mile Creek and without the age structure modification. So we're kind of reducing that structure, but we're trying to maintain that time series. I mean, we're reducing the, the annual kind of infrastructure required to do that. But we still feel that adding the additional data does give us some in interesting um, perspective on things and how that continues on. So some, you know, the life cycle monitoring project, this is all part of where we've got fish in, fish out sites up and down the Oregon coast that uh, full strength, we were at full eight full uh, fish and fish out sites. We're down to six now because of budget cutbacks. But the important part is that we've continued monitoring both in Lobster Creek and Ten Mile Creek, uh, where those initial paired watershed studies were, those kind of legacy IMW sites were, and maintaining that time series and seeing how, how fish affect, how things can continue decades after the treatment, is how things continue on. And the timing of this talk is great because we just put out an information report, uh, Chris Florian and a bunch of others that worked together to, to look at what's really going on, what we're actually getting out of that 27 years of data there, uh, looking at uh, the production out of these sites, life history characteristics, a lot of different things out of this, this life um, and the comparison of both you know, steelhead and coho in these two uh, ocean tributaries, uh, Cummins, Cummins and Ten Mile. And that information report should be available soon on our ODFW NRAMP uh, clearing, data clearinghouse. Um, or you can email me and I can get that to you too. But I'll just kind of digress for a little bit to kind of look at some of the things that are in the report about the, going into the details of what we get from 27 years of monitoring, um, looking at things like migration timing, got steelhead at the top and coho at the bottom. Um, and we see that you know these two sites are really, really strongly correlated. We have really consistent migration timing for a steelhead uh, between years. And again, the interesting thing about these streams is that these are you know right before they hit the ocean as fish leave our, our uh, screw traps and they're, they're in the salt water. So we know exactly when they're, they're actually hitting the ocean. And it's interesting to look at that in comparison to some of our inland sites that are quite a bit further inland, the LCM sites. And the, the date that 
fish are leaving 10 mile incumbents is you know as much as a week early later than they're leaving at some of our inland sites but steve johnson and others did work uh, looking at uh, migration timing of of um, steelhead as they move down through coastal waters and based on that work it looks like you know steelhead smolts from our inland sites and steelhead sites from these are all hitting the ocean about the same time so that's an interesting uh, you know demonstration of maybe some local uh, adaptations have been in direct ocean trip that they're going out later because they know that the ocean's right there so they're all hitting the ocean at the same time regardless of where they are in the stream network um, we're looking at we looked at age over a long age, age structure over a long period. I saw consistent results between both our treatment and reference sites. No greater than eight percent being uh, age two uh, steelhead smolts. Um, but it's interesting to compare this to some other studies that were done in coastal Oregon. We're seeing fewer age three fish at these uh, coastal sites, and that may be because of differences in methodology. Uh, some of the other sites are looking at uh, trying to dissect uh, um, smolt production. Uh, age structure from adult scales, and there's evidence that uh, larger um, smolts, which would tend to be older smolts, uh, survive better, so we get some survivorship bias and looking at trying to make uh, um, age structure of the smolt production estimates from adult scales. But there also could be some you know, real differences with these direct ocean trips, a little bit different, you know, they're mostly basalt, um, and they may have some real biological differences that cause age structure to be different than some of the Oregon, other Oregon coastal streams. Uh, but to get back to the, the kind of paired study, the IMW part of this, and what we've gotten from additional monitoring is additional monitoring continues to show that Cummins Creek wasn't a very good reference stream for 10 Mile Creek. Even with additional years, we don't see any kind of uh, correlation between the two sites and things like steelhead small abundance. And they're, they're right next to each other. They should be experiencing the same kind of um, environmental conditions, things like that, that would, the intrinsic factors that would affect small production for end year to year. But they're not having the same impact on both these streams. Um, and things like coho smolt size, or I guess coho and steelhead smolt size for both species is consistently smaller at, ten, at Cummins Creek. And Cummins Creek is the only of the two sites where we see uh, a correlation between smolt size and abundance. Whereas when there's higher abundance, smolt size is smaller for steelhead and, and coho in Cummins Creek. And kind of there's dependent, um, density dependent growth limitations at Cummins Creek, but not at 10 Mile Creek. So you see, you know, continuing that, you know, there was. Despite you know the best efforts going into this, you know that Cummins Creek would be a good reference stream for 10 mile. We see continuing that it, it doesn't really match up, despite the theoretical implications that it should. Um, but the approach to monitoring, we've continued in for another 10 years, adding on a big chunk of a small abundance data to the end of that initial IMW study, um, and we see from that you know abundance increased at both sites, both treatment, which is the same kind of result that they saw. Um, initially in the first part of that study, but that increase was larger at 10 mile. And with the additional years of data, we're able to do a randomized inter intervention analysis and find that um, the, the change that was much, that, that in the analysis indicated that the change was much larger than expected uh, by chance. And that steel had small production at 10 mile creek was indeed in, in, increased significantly relative to the treatment, to the reference Cummins Creek following the large wood addition. Uh, so we see that they weren't able to do a direct back comparison uh, with the amount of data they had at, at the end of 10 years. But any additional years of data uh, gave us a lot more power to resolve things, gave, resolve the two streams in reference to each other um, uh, and, and, and look for evidence, and we see evidence then of the treatment. So just kind of looking back at both the initial study and the, and the, the following years of, of data, what can kind of attribute to the successes of the, of the study and really, I think it was monitoring at multiple life stages that really helped out, you know, get, get down to what was occurring over a short period in that area. Um, looking, being able to look at survival and not just smolt production, um, being survival being more directly related to the treatment or smolt abundance, just measuring production from the freshwater. We expect uh, the treatment have an effect on that, but there are a lot of other variables that environmental and we see things like spawner abundance that are playing a role and smolt abundance that that complicates the, the um, analysis of what the effect of the treatment was. We monitor physical and biological responses. We could kind of tie in what the rest rate, what the treatment did to the habitat, and what that did to the fish. There definitely were problems with that initial time period. We had the 96 flood, which fortunately occurred in a treatment year, and it did not affect the reference stream to a great extent in the anadromy. 
But low spawner abundance really, I think, complicated things. You can see how we went from in the in the 90s to the 2000s. We had a reference stream, we had a tripling of coal smoke production, and there was no changes that happened. Our monitoring showed no changes that happened that during that period. This this change is really due to ocean conditions, to marine survival, and that really complicates the the analysis of what small production is, what the effects of small production is. We're trying to affect freshwater habitat when we've got the ocean kind of messing up with our system. We talked about how the reference stream didn't track when our continuing monitoring kind of shows that, so the back analysis wasn't appropriate for the initial study, but you know, doing the randomized intervention analysis later with a lot more user data, we're able to find a, a result of the treatment in reference to that, to, to, to both streams. There were some kind of thoughts, you know, looking back on the on the study about intense versus widespread monitoring. Uh, this study was doing a pretty intense monitoring at two two sites, um, but it turned out that one of those sites wasn't a good necessarily a good reference for that. So they're talking about maybe if we'd done less intense monitoring at a more site, um, would we have found to be a better reference for that? This would in this case, you know. The study was successful because with that intense monitoring, because we were able to drill down to a focus metric like survival that was affected, more directly affected by the treatment. But now we've got, with additional monitoring, we've got, well, maybe, you know, less intense monitoring, but for a longer time period, that also showed an effect of the treatment. That gives us a lot more power to resolve that with looking at just small production, where there's a lot more things to go into that. But over a long time period, we do see an effect of the restoration. Monitoring, we did, you know, one of the reasons for success was monitoring multiple life stages, but we didn't monitor spawners. And there could be additional life stages that we could look at. Um, and spawners really gives us a lot of context about being fully seeded. You know, is the small production really affect, is a result of habitat quality or is it a result of spawner production? Um, are density descendant effects consistent across years? And if we make more habitat, are there going to be juveniles that are available to exploit that? And ultimately, I mean, spawners are the ultimate thing that we wanted to produce. We didn't put this habitat restoration in there to make more small tomatoes to increase spawner returns. And so that's really kind of the ultimate response goal. So being able to monitor that, I think, would add more uh, strength to, the, to, what, to what we're saying about the, to the treatment, the effects of, of the treatment. So just to wrap up, I mean, by being able to look at both habitat and fish, identify a response to treatment, and that we could look at both kind of things like using a looking at survival provides a, um, a result in the short term. We're looking at abundance patterns, we're able to give us something in the long term. And we're, that reference stream, even though it didn't fit the suit, the, the normal backy design in a short time period, was able to give us some really interesting um, context for what was going on in 10 Mile Creek. And just to wrap up, just want to acknowledge you, know, we've been continuing to, to be working in Cummins and 10 Mile long after the initial study ended. But both the Forest Service and, and Audubon Society have been working in there as well. We've been cooperating with them. And I just want to give a shout out to Steve Johnson and Chris Lorraine and all of the dedicated field crews who have been working in there. And um, it looks like my time is about up, but I do, did want to just kind of talk, give some context too about how this, um, the effects of restoration and how they're continuing to be seen in many decades, decades after the treatment. And um, Jack Sleeper with the Forest Service has been doing a lot more of the, the habitat monitoring and can seem to look at how wood is moved in that system and the effects in there. And maybe we can you know, kind of talk about that. But whereas the difference we saw at Lobster Creek, how the habitat changed after restoration there and things flipped around there, maybe we can get that into the question period, but uh, I'll wrap up that. Thank you. <laughs>